Thank you so much, Marina, and thank you for the opportunity um, and the invitation to give this talk on translating research into future target therapies in oligodendric glioma's. Um, I practice at Royal North Shore Hospital, North Shore Private, and at Genesis Care. And I'm sure the audience is quite well versed in glioma's and oligodendric glioma's. So without further ado, let's get straight into it. It's hard to do any cancer talk without a flow diagram of, of sorts. And this one here is looking at the most up-to-date diagnostic paradigm for gliomas from the WHO classification in 2021. And of course, our uh, focus today is on um, the bit I've circled in red, um, IDH mutant 1P90Q co-deleted oligodendroglioma. Um, as you know, this current update in 2021 has been based on um, a lot more utilization and integration of molecular markers into the mix beyond just the normal histological um, information. This is naturally a great advance in our understanding of glioma's, uh, but it's also making it a little bit tricky sometimes to compare some of our historical data to our current um, molecular knowledge. As the diagnosis made back in the 1990s and early 2000s may well be different today, uh, for better or for worse. But before we look at what the future holds, let's just recap on what is the current standard in um, drug treatment, I guess, for oligodendroglioma's. In grade two in particular, um, we decide on our treatment pathways based on a risk assessment, including age, greater or less than 40, the extent of surgical resection, which I'm sure Jonathan's mentioned already, and level of symptoms uh, and deficits. In certain low risk patients, surveillance is a legitimate pathway, and this predominantly helps to spare the younger patients from toxicities um, of radiation and of chemotherapy. In higher risk patients, though, radi um, radiation will probably be immediate and is followed by chemotherapy. In all circumstances, if there is a clinical trial, that would be ideal. Clinical trial in oncology is the gold standard of care in many, many ways, and it's accepted globally. Amongst a group of anaplastic oligodendrogliomas of grade three, um, it's similar uh, paradigm compared to the grade twos. Uh, and the prefer option is still, of course, clinical trial, things like CODEL, uh, or else immediate radiation followed by chemotherapy. In a very select group, maybe we can think about doing watchful waiting, but um, this is not an evidence-based practice. So in summary, um, the current gold standard is maximal safe resection, then radiation, then chemotherapy, with a caveat on the timing of when radiation and chemotherapy should commence, um, either immediately or at the time of uh, relapse. You have probably noticed that I kept, I've uh, been saying chemo without actually making any reference to PCV or temozolomide chemotherapy. And as most of you will know, it is a very complicated area with no clear, straightforward answer. Um, let us try and address this problem by going back in time a little bit. So in my timeline here, going back to the beginning in around 1994 or five, there were two trials which was, um, started and recruited um, grade three patients, um, ERRTC26951 and RTOG9402, which I'm sure everyone's very familiar with. Both were investigating the benefit of adding chemotherapy to radiation versus radiation alone. In 1998, we did see a similar trial for grade two oligodendrogliomas. And it's important to note that a lot of these trials, as I said at the beginning, were reliant solely on histological diagnoses. Then in 2005, the famous Stoop protocol in GBN was published with Tamadol as the chemotherapy backbone. And it's kind of subsequent to that, uh, and I did talk to Dr. Wheeler about this yesterday as well, that it's, there was a kind of a, just a sudden abrupt change to move away from PCV for no particular reason um, and use temozolomide instead. And so a lot of the newer brain trials have used temozolomide without actually uh, going back to demonstrate temozolomide is better, the same or worse than PCV. Sadly, sometimes in medical oncology, we have done things without a lot of justification. Uh, for example, say in um, Avastin in GBM, um, we've never actually done a dose finding study to recommend the current uh, 10 milligrams per kilo uh, dosing. Uh, it isn't even the dose we use in bowel cancer, which is 50% of that. But for some reason, when the trial started, someone decided, hey, let's double the dose and let's see if it works better in brain. Um, and we kind of stuck with that. I've included catnon here. Um, which of course did not include oligodendroglyomas, but to show that in the more recent up-to-date uh, trial, temozolomide was shown to be quite useful, especially in the adjuvant setting uh, for radiation therapy. 
I know this doesn't ex you know, fully explain why we've made the leap from PCV to T um, tamazolamide, but hopefully you can appreciate that there has been an abrupt change um, and it may, and as a result, has posed more questions than answers so far. From CATNON and perhaps NOAA 4, we recognize that tamazolamide is a useful addition to radiation therapy alone. And as I keep saying, we don't know if that's equivalent to PCV, which is still seen in many parts of the world even, and even in our country uh, as a gold standard. PCV though is a combination of three drugs, which are you know, not easy to tolerate. Uh, added to the fact that vincristine is an intravenous chemotherapy, it's questionable whether it actually gets into the brain in the first place. So we may well be giving a drug that doesn't do very much except to cause problems in such as um, nerve uh, damage in the peripheral nerves, that is. Whereas tamazolamide, as we all know, is much easier to use, and let's face it, is used more widely across the spectrum, um, and you don't have to come into the chemo unit on a regular basis. Will we ever know the answer? Time will tell. Um, will we ever have the evidence to look you in the eye and say Temido is as good, if not better, than PCP? Uh, and perhaps the answer is potentially um, with the CODEL study, which is also an older trial, which I did list out in the timeline, um, started in 2009 and is still going amazingly. The original trial, as um, on the diagram here, says it's looking at radiation um, versus radiation plus Temido and plus uh, against Temozolomide alone. But because of the new data that um, Catnon produced, um, the temozolomide alone arm was dropped. Um, and in order to address this whole PCV versus temozolomide argument, adjuvant PCV was added into the radiation arm. So one can only hope with time, we'll know a little bit more about PCV versus temozolomide. Let's move on from chemotherapy for a minute and look ahead into the future, or in this case, still backwards still. Um, and because back in the mid, um, early to mid 2010s, targeted therapy became a, a, a popular thing, uh, if you like, in medical oncology. Um, it has helped convert so, some of the more deadly cancers where prognosis were extremely poor in the past to having patients staying well and alive for months and months and even years. The classic examples that we see quite often are from mutation-driven lung cancers and melanoma. So as you can see, I've, I've uh, put in two PET scans, uh, uh, two sets of PET scan images. The panel on the left uh, demonstrates significant bulky lymph node disease um, in the right shoulder uh, region. Uh, there's, uh, there's also masses in the lungs um, and further down into the right thigh bone here and the left, uh, uh, and the left thigh bone as well. And after a period of targeted therapy, they have melted away. Similarly, in, in the panel on the right, again, you, could, you don't have to be a nuclear medicine physician to understand that it's just, this is lighting up like a Christmas tree. And then after a period of time, it has disappeared. In these cancers, um, you know, obviously, you know, we've seen amazing results and, not a, uh, and apart from the radiological changes, we're seeing a lot of clinical benefits as well. And in this slide, we have a waterfall plot of a drug called seritinib, which is an ALK inhibitor used in lung cancer. And the blue bars are all heading south, indicating the, the degree of reduction in the size of these tumors. And you can see that the majority of the patients had huge responses below what we deemed as a significant number, which is minus 30%. And some of them have even scored 100% reduction. Having said that, targeted therapy is not for everyone. As you can see, there's one person that didn't respond despite having that particular target mutation. Um, and there's a couple that you know, was holding it steady but didn't do enough to reduce the disease burden. So in terms of selecting targets in glioma, so is this the holy grail we've been seeking for, um, not just in gliomas, but in oligodendrogliomas? Um, the interesting thing in gliomas, especially in GBM, I guess, is that from a gene and molecular change point of view, we know quite a lot about it. It's one of the first cancers to be mapped out completely uh, with whole, whole genome sequencing. We know everything from, you know, all the mutations that exist. Uh, and there have been many, many clinical trials in the past 10 to 15 years to try and target these mutations. Sadly, to not a lot of success thus far. Clinical trials have not be any, been as extensive in oligodendroglymas, and we'll come back to the reason why, but certainly there is a bit more change in this area now. And it's particularly because of this molecule here on the right, 
um, which is IDH. Um, and you have probably heard us talk about IDH quite a lot. We often say IDH mutation, IDH wild type, but what exactly is IDH? IDH is a very critical enzyme for normal bodily functions with a primary purpose to produce energy. How does it do this? Well, on the right is the dreaded Krebs cycle that we all have to learn as medical students and to be honest, we probably have all forgotten. Um, in order for glucose or sugar to be converted into actual energy or ATP in the body, the, the glucose goes through a range of steps that's very tightly controlled. IDH is one of those uh, critical steps that help um, um, this conversion. Um, in addition, it has a lot of other um, important homeostatic functions. Mutations, however, can occur in these areas, um, in, like in any other genes. Um, commonly, uh, we see mutations occurring in IDH1, um, which is what we see quite a lot in glioma's. We do see sometimes in IDH2 as well, which is probably 10% of the IDH mutation. The panel on the left illustrates all the normal pathways, which again, as I said, as medical students, we remembered very well. Nowadays, not so. Um, but what happens though, is instead of the normal processes going through, um, on the right is demonstrating what the mutation can cause. And it primarily leads to this green um, uh, chemical here, 2-hydroxyglutarate, two two which is a naughty enzyme or protein, which causes a lot of other cancer-related activities. Uh, which we'll come back to. So IDH was first discovered in, as I said, in whole genome sequencing environments in 2008. The formation of this 2-hydroxyglutarate, which we call an oncometabolite, is quite critical um, and leads to multiple other changes, such as uh, altering gene expression, um, allowing cancers to grow in a rather low oxygen environment. It inhibits P53, which is uh, what we call the guardian of the genome, which allows, again, the cancer to grow um, unwatched. It can also cause imbalances in, uh, imbalances in the energy production cycles, creating more reactive oxygen species, uh, which causes DNA damage. It can reduce even inflammatory and immune cells coming into the tumor area and overall, and that's why you know, there hasn't been a lot of success perhaps with immunotherapy thus far. So given IDH is such a problem, uh, what if we block it? Can we stop the cancer from growing? Can we cure cancer? Uh, after all, it is a very attractive drug target, um, is a target, is a mutation that influences so many other cancer-related pathways, and it's a mutation that persists. So unlike in GBM, where, you know, there's a lot of heterogeneity, where you have a ball of um, GBM that's, you know, say, taken out by Dr. Parkinson, that corner and that corner of the GBM and that corner and that corner may have very different uh, molecular changes, whereas in an IDH mutated tumor, usually the IDH persists throughout. So it's much easier to target on an ongoing basis. So what is available at the moment? So sadly, not much commercially per se. There are a couple of drugs um, that are being tested in clinical trials um, and it's being tested in also uh, AML, acute myeloid leukemia and also cholangiocarcinomas. And they are a little bit ahead compared to the IDH cohort in gliomas at the moment. Most of these drugs, thankfully, are reasonably well tolerated uh, with not a lot of significant toxicities thus far. Um, and this one, AG881 in particular, is blocking both IDH1 and IDH2, and it's meant to have better uh, blood-brain barrier penetration. Um, at the moment, access is mainly predominantly through clinical trials. Um, there is an access program through one of the drug companies. Uh, but it is quite a pricey uh, cost in um, about $20,000 a month, which leads to a phenomenon in medical oncology, which we call financial toxicity, uh, because if it works, you kind of keep paying, which is quite a substantial amount, unless the drug company has a cap on how much you uh, pay. It's kind of like the good old days with Avastin uh, in GBMs um, where before it was put on the PBS. Uh, remember, at that time, Roche had a $20,000 cap uh, program, which is equivalent to six doses of Avastin. Um, and unsurprisingly, the median number of doses that we tend to give was six. 
Um, another area that's being investigated in terms of targeting IDH are vaccines. So vaccines, of course, are a hot topic in the last two years. And one of the many benefits of COVID vaccines are the fact that it has probably advanced this area of technology by a huge amount. And cancer, we think, is going to benefit significantly from this. Um, and it sounds good in theory, you know, there's the IDH, what if we target this with vaccines? Um, it, vaccines in gliomas have been tried. We've had the EGFRP free trial. Uh, unfortunately, that was negative. However, we know anecdotally that it did wipe out the population of EGFRP free uh, cells um, when we've tested for it in a re-operation sample. So the it wasn't so much that this vaccine probably didn't work, it was it worked so well that it created uh, room for all the non B free cells probably to prosper. Survival of the fittest also exists in the cancer world. Having said that, it also isn't so straightforward to target IDH um, with vaccines because uh, unlike say, for example, here I've put in a picture of COVID, um, the spike protein is what the vaccines are aiming towards. As I mentioned to you before, IDH causes problems in the mitochondrion or mitochondria, which is sitting deep inside the cell next to the cell nucleus. And so whether the IDH mutation, uh, IDH vaccines can get into the, you know, can cause problems for the mitochondria or deep inside the cell is remains to be seen. Thinking beyond IDH inhibitors and vaccines, there are certainly quite a bit of action in many other drug development areas targeting other parts of IDH mutation and also a lot of its downstream effects. Drugs are being developed to target other molecules um, that arise um, uh, in oligodendrogliomas or as a result of the errors made uh, by IDH mutation and formation of 2-HG or 2-hydroxyglutarates. Um, other targets are also being developed to work with the IDH inhibitors that I've mentioned to capitalize on their abilities to reverse some of the cancer related activities. The aim there is to try and reverse some of the cancer environment to make it uh, you know, cl a bit closer to normality so that some of our usual cancer drugs might actually start working like PARP inhibitors or immunotherapy. We've often talked about phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. And I thought in the remaining time period, I might spend a little bit of time going through some of the key aspects of drug developments and clinical trials. So this is a big diagram and I've got quite a bit to say on this too. So when we hear about a drug being approved by the FDA or TGA for cancer patients, what is not often reported is the labor time resources that have been put in for that one drug to reach that very stage. As you can see from the left of the picture, it's a funnel effect. So we know a lot about the basic research. Like I said, we know everything about the gene, genetic changes in GBM uh, right now, for example. There's a lot of targets out there. So we know, for argument's sake, um, we know mutations in, say, gene A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, X, Y, Z. And perhaps there are 20 companies out there that are developing drugs to target A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and X, Y, Z. They try this in the preclinical setting. So they do it in the little cells in the petri dish in, a, in the lab. And then if they get a bit of success, they move into animals. And it's about at this stage that you start to hear some of these prelim data coming through. And it's usually the one pager that you can Google online. Next though, it has to be done and tested in humans because that's what the FDA mandates um, um, in terms of good clinical trials practice and governance. The, MDA, uh, the FDA rather mandates a certain amount of rigor that each new drug has to go through before it gets any approval. And as you can see in the phase one setting, we're looking at very small amounts of uh, patients, uh, usually beginning with healthy humans, um, because you're really just trying to see is this drug safe to be used in human beings. More and more because of the push in certain diseases like cancer and others as well, the phase one testing are being done in um, the actual dis uh, patients with the disease themselves. What happens with um, phase one though, because the drug uh, dose discovery stage, it means that we don't know what the right dose is to give pa to patients. And most of the trial structure is on a, uh, utilizes what we call a three plus three scheme. Uh, scheme. So the first three patients enter into the phase one trial um, at the lowest dose that deemed to be safe. And if nothing happens to those three patients, they continue, but the next cohort will go up on a, the drug level. 
and the next cohort will go up on the next drug level and so on and so on until you hit a certain amount uh, of drug dosing where you are experiencing a lot of toxicities. And then of course you stop. And the drug that gets taken to the next phase is the, actually the one down from the maximum, uh, is the one down uh, from the toxic dose level uh, that was reached. Um, and that will, uh, that, as I said, that, was, that is the uh, dosing that will be taken to phase two. If the drug reaches phase two, um, you would hope one that it has demonstrated some benefit uh, to the small amount of patients so far and that it is well tolerated. Uh, in phase two, more patients will come into contact with the drug traditionally. Um, and flexibility has now been given in phase two where there's a lot more randomized trials being undertaken. In phase two, drugs may be pipped against a placebo or standard of care. But traditionally, FDA relies on phase three clinical data where there's a lot more patients uh, being recruited with specifics looking at the overall survival and the progression-free survival. These are what we call the registration trials. And the problem is, as you can see with the funnel effect, not everything that gets to that phase three area will succeed. We've seen this quite often in GBMs. We have had tons of phase three clinical trials. Again, using Avastin as an example, um, we've had the two um, frontline Avastin trials, which were both unfortunately negative. Um, which was a lot of caused a lot of disappointment um, for everyone back in 2013 or 15, um, and it never made the the cutoffs that FDA demanded them, which was overall survival, and so it was never recognised and uh, got registration. Why do clinical trials fail? So you say, oh look, it's gone through phase one, phase two. Why does it not get up when it gets to phase three? That's a whole different talk in itself, um, but I will highlight perhaps the difficulties in doing trials in areas like oligodendroglyomas is the fact that it has a very long natural history. Thinking back again to the two seminal papers I've mentioned, EORTC 26951 and RTOG 9402, the interim readings at six years were, were neutral. They couldn't find any difference. Um, and it took another six years for results to actually mature and for the, that survival curve to actually split. And so, you know, it is a very long struggle, uh, especially for uh, cancers with a long, long natural history. So when, uh, oops, sorry. Coming back to my original timeline now though, hopefully by targeting IDH, we can incorporate this if it's um, successful in the future to play a major role in the management of IDH mutation, uh, muta uh, mutated gliomas, including of course oligodendrogliomas. One would hope that in 10 years time, we will have more data from a combination of, you know, retesting some of the older specimens and from newer trials, we will be able to develop something uh, new that can continue to improve the, um, the survival and the quality of life of oligodendroglyomate patients. Uh, that's better than our current standard at the moment. Let's hope that if I was giving this talk in 2032, I will be able to elaborate a bit more on the gold standard um, of maximal safe resection than radiation, than chemotherapy. And perhaps we will be able to add in, um, you know, additional drugs that we can slot in at various stages to continue to delay any cancer progression um, into the future. Thank you very much for your attention.